listener production. I'm automotive commentator and journalist Greg Rust, and this is Rusty's Garage. For this episode, my guest and I are split by the Tasman. I'm in New Zealand and he's in Brisbane at the Car Expert office there where he's now a test driver and working with their review team. Chris Atkinson is an Aussie rally driver who made his mark in just about all corners of the globe. I can recall working with him on the Australian Championship coverage in the early 2000s when he first burst onto the scene. From a family with rallying in their veins, he rapidly climbed the ladder, and I mean rapidly. From accolades as a privateer to Asia-Pacific titles, plus podiums and 41 stage wins in the World Rally Championship, where he got to drive a number of different WRC cars during his time there. Talk about envy, not to mention some of the legends that he hung out with. We'll talk about that too. He is fast, unapologetic about his 10 tense approach. There were frustrations, which you'll hear about, that prevented him from putting full campaigns together at times. But Chris created and found new opportunities. More recently, it's been in the United States, blending some of his circuit racing experience with his first love. Rallycross is a hell of a show, and it brought him back into the iconic blue Subaru colours. Seems like yesterday that he was a little tacker in Bega, southeast New South Wales, where there are some awesome rally roads. I would have been three or four years old and standing on the side of the road and uh, my dad doing the Bega Valley Rally, which he won a few times. So, yeah, that's that's where it all started. Like um, My first experience in a rally car was strapped in one of those old foam car seats in Bega in the back roads hitting jumps with my dad like with a with a harness on it <laughs> at three or four years of age so yeah yeah that's where it started take us there what kind of car because when I look back at your dad's history I can recall uh, Ford Escorts Nissan Stanza Triple S's what was that car that you went for a ride in can you remember that would have been the Stanza the Datsun Stanza which was like a Pluto pup color actually a really cool car real drive sounds amazing um, he did go into Subarus funnily enough after that the all-wheel drive, the first sort of um, all-drive rally cars from Subarus, but um, that's the one I remember, that that rear-wheel drive stanza. He's a winner of the New South Wales Rally Championship. He's in the, the record books there. I think he's, the 1980 win would have been when you were one year of one, one year old. Yeah, just, so was, yeah. I don't know what mom, yeah. mom, how mum was dealing with that yeah. with me running around. <laughs> I wanted to touch, though, mate, on, on two wheels before we get too far into to rallying and cars because he was actually pretty handy back in the day on two wheels I think your dad wasn't he I, I mean some enduro riding there and he's he's had uh BMW 1200s a KTM 990 Super Duke and am I right in saying he has done a Himalayan tour on a Royal Enfield is that true yeah I don't think it was a smart idea but <laughs> 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 pretty much ended up in hospital did he yeah at more not from an accident just from uh food poisoning and uh oh yeah didn't have the great experience there he's probably a bit older than he thought he was and um and they just uh had a tough time up there but yeah he loves adventure loves getting amongst it um before I was born uh, things like the Amco 1000 desert race um yeah, so it's funny how because his parents weren't like into motorsport at all. So he, uh, my grandfather uh, was more into business, um, quite successful in that. And then for some reason, dad just loved cars, loved motorsport and um, just found his own way with it. Got into bikes, uh, raced on Husqvarna's in motocross and desert races. He just got out there and got amongst it. Um, a different time and era, but yeah, what he did and what he went through, I think he almost killed himself uh, in a motocross race. He was in hospital with um, lung shock, like all, both legs broken, arms broken, uh, into the tree line, like at 100 mile an hour. Um, so he's been through a lot. Uh, then he figured out that a car was probably a safer option and, and gone into rallying. And to be honest, if he didn't do that, then I wouldn't have gone rallying, I guess, because that's, that's how it sort of all evolves, isn't it? It is. It, ironically, though, mate, although the, the two-wheel misadventures might have put him off, it didn't put you off. You you actually ended up doing a bit of motorbike stuff when you were younger. Tell us about that. What was the first bike and how did that all get started? Just one of those things, you know, young boys need to 
to have an outlet. And then um, we got, I'd say, like a little like 80, uh, it's a DT80, like a um, Suzuki. Um, the first sort of race bike was a KX, KX80 and then started some motocross, um, which was fun. I, I can't say I was like amazing at it. I was just, I was a decent rider, sort of A-grade club level. Um, there were some young kids around at that time who went on to race Supercross in Australia and that from the Gold Coast. Um, Chris Urquhart, who still does stuff around, I see on bikes these days and, and raced a bit of Supercross. And um, it was a, a great experience. I think it sort of built the foundation of my understanding of uh, competing and driving fast, but maybe wasn't a natural natural thing for me. And then I started to get a few, you know, when you push the boundaries, you know, broken arms, broken wrists, things going on. And, and my schooling started to drop a little bit. So mum and dad was sort of like, you've got to sort of ease back on the the racing till your, your grades get better. And not that they were bad, they were probably just not ideal. And then funnily enough, I ended up getting a scholarship to university off my grades. So um, it's uh, interesting how things work out. We'll get to your university in a minute. I, I just in wrapping up the bike stuff, and you, you know, you've touched on injuries and and things like that. Was it a window into your competitive nature, or was it pure passion and love of the machine, or a, a mix of both? What was it that was kind of coming out at that stage? I think that's pretty clear with me is the competitive side. Like I, I, I'm not a as much as I love cars and have loved cars growing up, etc., I wouldn't call myself a car nut, absolutely, but I'm competitive. So if I find something I'm good at, like everything goes into it, you know? So that's that's sort of why my career evolved that way. When I realized quite early on I was decent at rallying, then a lot of energy went into that. So, and if I'm not good at something, um, I brush it off pretty quick and, and find something that I like and, and want to do. Share with the audience because in truth, your rallying actually started in the other seat, didn't it? As a as a navigator, or <laughs> which a, was very silly. What were you like as a co-driver? Come on, useless, absolutely useless. <laughs> I remember one of my brother's mates. So my brother bought a rally car. When we were at uni, uh, an old uh, Corolla, real drive Corolla, like 1971 Corolla, um, just to go and have fun. And he obviously remembered my dad rallying, being a couple of years older. So he remembered that and went out, got a car. It was like ten grand or something, you know and just wanted to have some fun. And yeah, I went around the streets a couple of times in it, but my first go was with one of his mates as a co-driver. And it's not like I was scared. I was just <laughs> useless at, at it. Uh, I sent him up the wrong road. Um, like I had no idea what I was doing. Absolutely no idea. And probably realized, like, like we were saying before, realized that I wasn't any good at it. So lost interest pretty quick. Great stuff, though, with your brother. I mean, Ben is still co-driving even now. I see him at events from time to time. So, you know, a cool way for you both to, to get started. Yeah, so I even co-drove for him in an event as well. So um, they were the, the KCF rally sprints up here and, and sort of the Queensland Championship round. So I did a, a – I'd say I probably co-drove two or three times. Um, I've tried to block it out of my memory so I don't, <laughs> don't remember it too much. Um but pretty quickly, I uh, convinced him to let me have a go at, at driving his car and then I crashed it on the second stage. So um, that was my introduction to, to driving. But somewhere there, you obviously decide to explore the driving side of it further. You, you know, you weren't put off by that that incident. And there's a good story about you going to a rally school with Neil Bates's brother, Rick Bates, and, and sort of learning to tune the skills. Is that right? Yeah, so it must have been before I did the – I maybe co-driven a couple of times and um, Rick was doing these rally schools where you get 10, 15 people along um, and sort of help people with their setup of their car and do a bit of training and coaching and stuff and um, braver man than me, to be honest, because you're just jumping in with the randoms. <laughs> they had no idea, especially me, what they were doing. And I went up and down the road with Rick and he goes, oh, how long have you been racing? And I go, oh, my first go driving on dirt. And um, he goes, well, you're a fair bit quicker than my brother. So, uh, <laughs> and he'd been racing for two years. So um, he thought it might be a good idea that I got behind the wheel. And um, and obviously it was uh, great advice from Rick and, and great to have that opportunity, you know, to sit in with someone like that and, and see what he did as well at the time. And I've always had that experience throughout my career where guys have helped by taking me for a ride in the car. And I think it it opens your eyes to what the potential is. And that's that's so cool. So at what point did the conversation happen then that you would literally kind of trade places and, and 
pursue this. But but I, I asked that uh, in a, in a two prong sense here, Chris, because when you bought that Evo Five, I think the actual plan was that you'd all have a go and share different aspects, and even your dad might do some driving again. Is that right? The idea, Dad would do some tarmac rally sprints. There were some little rally sprints getting around on the Gold Coast at those times. Ben would do like the KCF rally, rally short course stuff. And then I would go and do the Queensland Championship. And so this would have been just after I'd crashed his um, bright green little Corolla. <laughs> has, he, has he not forgiven you for that? <laughs> <laughs> probably not, probably not. <laughs> but yeah, that sort of uh, led us to buy that Evo 5 off um, the Shepherds who were into rallying up here, George Shepherd, And I saw Steve Shepherd actually the other day, funnily enough. Um, so that was our first serious rally car. So we, went, we, we realised... Um, and Dad called up Ed Ordinsky, who you knew from back in the day, and Ed was obviously at the top of the Australian Championship around those times, and he basically said, you need to be in an all-wheel drive rally car and you need to be doing pace notes as soon as possible. Um, and that was sort of awesome advice. Like, that that really sort of got us going in the right direction. Like, I think I've done two blind rallies in my time, you know, un- unpaced note, yet most of the state championships were all blind rallies. So um, I think getting onto pace nights so early and making them a big part of my career were critical. But but back to the Evo anyway. So Dad ended up maybe doing one rally sprint. Um, I don't know if Ben even got to do a, a KCF <laughs> in the Evo. Um, and the first round of the Queensland Championship, I think I was leading um, straight away. And so that was my second rally after I'd crashed the Corolla. Uh, and we had a, I remember a boost pipe got um, stuck. Um, so we lost boost uh, and I think we finished second or third um, and one group N or whatever. But that was my first, basically my first rally. So it seemed to be um, something that I was decent at straight away. And it was the beginning of what would be a meteoric rise that would get you to the, the WRC within something like a, a four-year period. It was, it was an insane uh, uh, cram of learning, wasn't it? Yeah, when you, when you think about it, like from like, and I started so late really at, at 20 years of age, basically, um, nearly 21. Like I was working in a stockbroking firm. I'd left uni and was uh, working in a stockbroking firm in Brisbane. Um, and then my rally career started. So it's from what, 2001 then to be in the WRC and started 2005. Yeah, it's it's a pretty crazy um, time. and th- But a lot of things had to fall into place then, you know, that it was all timing and effort and putting the pieces of the puzzle together and and even just random meetings at airports with people that you've never met before that all of a sudden lead to a a wrc drive so it's um it didn't feel crazy at the time to be honest but as when you look back at it like that it does it does look a bit crazy how it all went down i'm glad you bring up bond university and and stockbroking and things like that what what was the degree that you did and were you any good as a stockbroker has it helped you in later life I did a finance accounting majors, so I uh, went to Bond Uni, um, was fortunate to get a scholarship to go there, so that helped mum and dad out. Not that racing probably did after that anyway. <laughs> but, yeah, so went there um, and then straight out of uni went to work at Morgan, so it was Bell Morgan. Um, it's now Bell Potter, a stockbroking firm. Um, and learn a lot. Like, I had no idea what I was doing, to be honest. You, you learn a bit. It was like this tech boom time. There was money getting thrown everywhere and then money getting lost pretty quickly as well. So um, it did form, like I still trade a lot today um, and it's actually quite a good passion of mine. So it's something I enjoy to do. Um, and um, and I guess without that background, I wouldn't wouldn't be doing that as much. You'd, you'd hand the money over to someone else that knew what they were doing. But yeah, I, I enjoy it. And, um, and it's funny how you sort of, it's great to have that foundation to come back to um, later in life and and I think it's something that will will be a benefit for the rest of my life as well like knowing how to invest understanding markets and and having those seen those experiences as well of of like I'm more of a cautious investor than than you always you even hear on the golf course these days like someone hears of a stock tip and you can always bet it's going to go the other way it's already too late once once it's there so um, yeah, it's it's um, good to have seen those things and and have that experience. So you have that phone call with Ed Ordinsky who talks about, you know, the importance of of um, getting your head around pace notes and things like that. How did that process go? Who helped you with that? And then when did the idea of Rotto, let's have a crack at an Australian Rally Championship round. When did that sort of venture into discussion? 
basically happened straight away. We, he basically said, you need to go to Pace Noted Events. And the only Pace Noted Events was coming up was Rally of Canberra. I might have missed one. There might have been a KCF rally sprint in there, but say my third proper rally was Rally of Canberra in 2001. So we basically went straight into it. Um, and uh, my notes are really based off Ed's notes. Um, that was sort of the foundation of my notes. He, uh, he talked me through it. I sat in the car with him and spent a lot of time sort of understanding. He used one to 10, I used one to 10. Um, and so his, his encouragement there, his support, like that really just was a foundation of what I think was a big part of my success, which was my pace notes. So the effort we used to put into pace notes, um, I'd drive around for hours on end at, at night at like 40 kilometers an hour on the back roads of the Gold Coast. And we just drive around riding pace notes for hours and hours every night. I don't know why I did it. I, I just saw the importance of it. And and we just, me and Ben would just go out in the road car and just drive around writing pace notes and checking them and not driving fast, like just checking the notes going, okay, that makes sense. Um, and, and I think that really built the foundation. Uh, and I saw early on, like there's a lot of people that write notes and it never, it was just like six right, six left, six right, six left. And it's like, well, what's, where's the difference? Like, where's the, where's the picture? And so my pace notes are about painting a picture in my mind. So even though you can't see the road, the notes um, relay a picture back to you. And so there has to be a point of difference, even if it's subtle, but then you, you it comes to your mind a lot easier, the picture, where if you, I just said six right, six left, six right, he was like, well, they're not, they're not all the same. You know, there's differences. And I, and I think that foundation and Ed's, um, point of saying how important the pace notes were really made a difference early on. It's it's a unique language, Chris, that you you have to get used to, and and you have to, as you say, more or less tailor it to you so that it, that it works for you. How quickly did it get to the point of um, you being able to to digest it, to trust it, and at the same time you're trusting your brother here? So did, did that ever create moments of, of tension between the pair of you, or was it always a great experience? I'd I'd say uh, as the speed evolved, then maybe more tension came in um, because the importance of the note being on time and correct just goes up a level every gear you go up you know that's that's just critical um not saying with ben but even with other co-drivers you'll hear me a lot of times saying yep 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 like i need the note i need the note like you you want it like urgently i'd say that's the biggest thing and because there is a fair amount of information in my notes it makes it hard you know for the co-driver um in terms of timing it and it's got to still flow so they've got to know when to be quick when to be slow um and when you see their booklets like with stefan the underlying and the colours, it's all mean different paces for him to read at. Like, it's such a skill. And Ben was a, a really good co-driver and still is, like you said, he's still out there doing some co-driving and why I guess we drifted apart there, like, I, it just wasn't gelling perfectly and I was pushing so hard, like, in every aspect. I was probably too hard on him, to be honest. Um, and, like, from the fitness side to everything, it was like, I don't why I was so into it, who knows? But um, yeah, it was just everything like your diet. Yeah, I was probably I was probably an absolute asshole to him. But <laughs> I was just like, um, I knew where I wanted to go. And, and I think I remember, actually, I remember one corner and it was in New Zealand. And I remember I was in the Suzuki, the Super 1600 car. And I took this one corner, like I'd never taken a corner before. Um, and actually dad, Dad saw the other side of it, me coming out of it, and you were just so committed to the note, to knowing exactly where the car needed to be, that I was like, and and I was up against a guy called Nicky Shelley, who's um, a German guy, awesome, awesome guy. I went and spent time with him in in Germany, and it was the first time I really started to take him down as a teammate, like time wise, just like just step it up a notch, and it was just commitment to the notes, like that everything was positioned before the corner that you were in exactly the right spot at exactly the right speed or because of that pace note on your first pass, you know, you were just on it. And and that's probably the time which would have been um, in 2003 that sort of I've really found my speed, I'd say. 
Amazing. There's lots of different co-drivers. I mean, we're digressing here for a second, mate. We've talked about Ben. Glenn McNeil was in there, obviously. You've mentioned Stefan. He represents at, at the WRC level a significant portion of your your career, mate. What was that relationship like? How well did it work? And, and so on. Obviously, when uh, sort of Glenn and I separated then, um, I was, we were looking around for a new co-driver and at ProDrive sort of we made a list um, and we had a sort of a short list and I won't name names on there, but Stefan Sarazan rang me up out of the blue um, who had done some F1 and was into rallying. Um, and he basically said, uh, if you're going to pick anyone, picks, uh, I've had Stefan Prevo in the car and he was absolutely amazing. Um, and he was on our list and um, yeah, we gave Stefan a call, he came to a test and it just worked straight away. Um, and I I literally, it would be not even a ha- out of how many thousands and thousands of corners we've done, like it would be less than a handful that you would have any slight issue with. It's just crazy how good he is in the car. Um, such a professional, that's all he's, his dad was a doctor um, and his dad really wanted to be a doctor as well. And he was just so into rallying growing up and realized he could be a driver and, it, and sort of from the mid eighties just became a professional co-driver and loved it and has been ever since. And the guys he sat with in his career, obviously I haven't sat with every co-driver, but he's got to be top three in the world. And everyone who ever has him as co-driver is just blown away. Um, he, he doesn't get overly involved in politics. He just gets on with his job does the job, keeps it calm. Like you'll pull up um, cause it, cause he was obviously French speaking Belgium. Um, so we'd all, it, funny after stages, you all sort of pull up in different groups who you want to hang out with. And so we'd always be with uh, Sebastian Loeb and, and Daniel Eleanor. And the three of them are just there smoking on the side of the road, <laughs> just chilling out <laughs> on the random Aussie. We're just talking shit. And that was sort of our after stage routine. Um, he'd have a cigarette and, and they'd all just chill on the side of the road and then um, go again. get back in and get re- ready to get going. And it was just a, a really relaxed but professional environment. And, um, and just, yeah, like I can't speak highly enough of him. I want to conclude the Australian Championship here, that that portion of your career. And you've mentioned about the Suzuki a moment ago and how you, you went and did some stuff for Monster Tajima, which was, which was huge too. Good period for the ARC. Names like Cody Crocker, Dean Herridge, Ed Odinski, who you, you've mentioned. For you in that that Group N phase, mate, I think there's a there's a privateers title. There are um, you know top five stage times. I mean, just it was as we reflected before. It really was a steep and meteoric rise, wasn't it? It was sort of crazy. We had no understanding. Like we had no idea about the car. We had no idea about differential suspension, everything like that. So. Um, that Evo basically had no front differential. Um, it was just like, a, it was basically just a very basic, like beginner's Evo. We like, we had no idea. Like, at, like you imagine this is our third rally and, and you're straight into that. Um, it was heavy. It wasn't a, it was built just to be a reliable sort of customer car call. It wasn't there. And we were reasonably competitive in it, but we had no idea what we we're doing. Absolutely no idea. So I'm learning all the time. Um, about suspension and stuff like that. But really, we just put a setting in and go, okay, let's go and try and have some fun and, and do some quick times. And once we started to understand that, I think in the second year, so then we're, okay, we need a front differential. That might help, <laughs> things like that. Um, some better dampers. We'll try and make the car a bit lighter. Um, so then it got a bit more serious. And I think that's the, the year we won the Privateers uh, Cup. But I think where it sort of kicked off was, came back to Rally at Canberra, so a year later, so the Asia Pacific round. And that's obviously when we caught uh, Monster's Eye and Paul Wilding, who was there working for him, um, who sort of pushed for us to be involved. And that led to a test in Japan. And it must have been winter in Hokkaido. So we're up in the North Island of Japan. Um, And myself and Richard Mason were asked to go up and test the Suzuki and it was really a showdown between the two of us to, to see who got the drive. So this was my first chance at getting a basically a paid drive and what, what we were two years into rallying and the test was a Jim Carner monster set up around the car park Fantastic. in the Super, 16, <laughs> Super 1600 <laughs> and it went down to like obviously personality and things like that who like who was getting along with everyone but yeah, it was basically this Jim Carner in the car park 
to see who would win. And I, th- I think I, I think he stalled to be honest somewhere during and I won <laughs> like ten seconds, and and that was it. Then you had a drive. Like it was just so random that that's where that decision was made, and that could have been. Richard Mason's, which he's obviously done a lot of stuff in New Zealand as well, but that was sort of my my breakthrough into getting a, a it was a factory drive. It was pretty much one of the few in the Asia Pacific and um, I was able to to get it at, what, 22 years of age. So that was, that was very cool. And I think that transition from being a really amateur, like in the Group N car, even though we won the Privateers Cup and we're sort of setting some decent times to going into a professional team really really made a big difference in terms of like the support, the understanding, the technical side of things as well. You get an opportunity with Monster Tajima. You're all dressed in yellow. What's the Super 1600 like to drive? Because you've gone from a production-based Mitsubishi Evo to, uh, you know, a high-revving front-wheel drive. Was there learnings and all that or what, what was it like? Yeah, it was a massive, massive learning curve, like such a different car, like a uh, so much more like rewarding if you pushed it hard where a group N car you had to really control yourself um but in that car you could like push it um, beyond the limit and get away with things a lot more where a group N car could quite easily break or or basically you didn't get the best time out of it so that was a really good step for me going into a world rally car as well because there's a lot of guys that especially around that time that were super quick in group N cars and they'd hop in a world rally car and wouldn't go much quicker than they were in their group N car um where hopping that Super 1600 car enabled me to sort of push the boundaries and explore a lot more. Um, but it was also a big challenge because the year after, which I'm sure you'll sort of get to, but when I was in the, the Subaru and I was swapping between the Evo, uh, the Subaru and the Super 1600 car, it actually would take me a couple of stages to adapt back into the Group N car from driving the Super 1600 because they were so different to get the most out of. And I'd always overdrive the um, the Group N car on the first few stages and I had to dial it back every time and then go, okay, yep, that's that's how to get the most out of this car. So it really taught me a lot um, and gave me a good understanding about different driving styles and, and different sort of techniques. He's a hero too in rallying terms what was monster like and being a part of that whole operation yeah he's uh he's an entertaining one he's a character that's for sure um no just um yeah a great experience to work with someone like that he's just so into it and so passionate um like to go to his workshop in japan and like all the all the hill climb cars just lined up like twin engine hill climb cars just un unreal some of the stuff he had there and yeah, his whole enthusiasm for it. Um, but he's a hard man as well. You know, you've got to perform. You've got to do the good, right job. And um, Paul Wilding, in a way, was a big part of that as well, um, who was based here on the, the Gold Coast. He he basically ran that team for, for Monster, and he was a big part of pushing for me to get there and supportive of that. And we had such a good time, you know, those early days in the Asia Pacific and just the adventure and, like, and to be honest, there wasn't a lot of competition in Super 1600 in Asia Pacific. It was more about me exploring my own boundaries a bit. And um, and as much as they were disappointed if I had an accident or something, like they knew it was part of the learning curve because I was so, so fresh to it. And putting me against teammates to see, to, to challenge me and push me was like a really good thing. And I think that, especially when Rally Japan came around each year, that was a, that was a big, big thing. How, I mean, you've sort of, over time, Chris, r- rallying in Asia ha- has been a um, a real staple for you. There's been, you know, World Rally Championship, which we'll get to, and and some great stuff in America as well. But but a significant period of time, you, you've competed in all sorts of countries throughout Asia quite regularly, haven't you? Yeah, it's it's actually funny how it actually became um, a big part of my career, even a big thing. To uh, I spent a lot of time racing in China as well. Um, but yeah, Asia Pacific, like we got to race in India, like I said, China, like in the Pacific, in New Caledonia, um, New Zealand, which are basically the best rally roads in the world. Um, so my, it actually was a good learning experience because I got to drive on heaps of different, even though they're all gravel, they were such 
varied gravel in terms of the style of roads and things like that. Where you come to Australia and they're a bit different, the roads, but in a way still quite similar. So for me to go to these countries and like like the back roads in India and um, Malaysia and Thailand and these places, like it's just so different. Um, it was a good, good learning experience for me because when you go to the World Championship, so many rallies are very different to Australia. So it was a, a great sort of learning curve and great experience. And, and then when I came back to do the Asia Pacific a few times, it was just a lot of fun. You know, it's a fun series. It's not as serious, obviously, as the WRC and um, and we just it's just sort of a, a good adventure. How did you get to Pro Drive? And I would imagine meeting David Richards. Did you go to headquarters at Banbury there? And how did those conversations start about the possibility of going to the World Championship? So funnily enough, the first discussions we had were actually with Ford. So we were talking about going to M Sport, um, but that would have meant going um, straight into Monte Carlo Rally in 05. Um, and we had an offer um, from Ford, from M Sport, and um, we also then had an offer from Subaru. But I guess it comes back to... Um, where it all evolved from was um, Rally Japan. So the first time I went to Rally Japan, um, I was up against Daniel Carlson, who was a world junior um, WRC champion. And this is where a little bit of frustration came in from our end with the Suzuki deal, um, is that I wanted to go to Europe. Like we knew that's where you had to go and we were sort of stuck in the Asia Pacific. Um, And I ended up beating... Daniel Carlson on that rally and I think we were even leading the Group N cars like in a gravel rally in a front wheel drive car I think it was quite competitive um, for a front wheel drive car on gravel and sort of the times we were setting were pretty ridiculous Um, and funnily enough Dad and another guy Bevan who were travelling with me ran to Paul Howarth at the airport and they were all lost they are in Hokkaido and they are all completely lost no idea what they are doing and Paul House, the team manager for the Subaru World Rally team, and they just started talking to each other at the airport, lost. Um, all got along well. And then Paul was watching one of the stages with Dad and Bevan, and he uh, he goes, oh, there's Daniel. He's going, he's much more committed than Chris through there, um, blah, blah, blah. And then he had it the wrong way around. We'd swapped orders for the stage, and it was actually me going through first. And then Daniel came through and he's like, oh, there you go. Da- there's Chris. He's not quite as committed. And Ben was like, no, that, that, that's Daniel. Chris was the first one. <laughs> and then they started to see the times come up and they're like, oh, shit. Um, okay, that, that's interesting. We ended up having dinner um, after the rally, Paul Howarth and um, with Dad and Bevan. And that sort of started that discussion with with ProDrive and the, the opportunity of the WRC Um was presenting so it was just uh crazy how like things like that sort of evolve into they they knew who i was but they weren't like i wasn't on their radar up until then and all of a sudden they start keeping a closer eye on you and then then things evolve so then we had the two basically two offers uh, unfortunately those times it actually meant you had to bring money to to get the drive but probably two years early and i would have walked in on a million euros and um when you think about it, like the budget at Subaru World Rally Team at the time was, say, 30 million euros um, and we had to bring, I think it was a million euros, but it was a, a deal where it basically unwound itself. So as long as I continue with the team, then it would all get paid back, et cetera, and then you, basically through salary. So it was it was quite easy where we, we did the investment structure that it was um, that it would pay itself back as long as I was any good in the world championship yeah so it was basically down those two offers but we had great support from nick senior and subaru australia and we also felt loyal to them from the support they showed um in that 04 season um to run that privateer car where they helped fund that um that sort of led us to go the subaru way and they put some money towards that that program in the in the wrc and yes it's a paid seat but basically anyone that went there had to bring money it didn't really matter so and like i said if, if it was a couple of years earlier where where Peta got his first drive then it was the opposite case in the same situation of driver if you know what i mean mate the the thing that sort of stands out for me there is is that um there's been for you in your career i mean you, you you've you learnt the 
the the hustle, the business side. You know, you're you're the competitive athlete. You've spoken about that, but at the same time, there's been a few freakish chance things like that at airports or or whatever, hasn't there? And I think it's life, but I think you, it's whether you're open to the opportunity, aren't you? It's it's like um, if you're always open to to grab an opportunity, they seem to present themselves as well. So yeah, it's hundred percent timing and and things like that. But you've also got to put yourself in the right place to have an opportunity to have those timing and and chance meetings as well. So it's crazy how things happen. But I, you speak to a lot of successful people um, in all sorts of business whatever and it's the same thing you know it's that chance encounter or that random meeting or whatever or that split decision you know that leads to something that's successful but if you're not open-minded to that then they never appear so um it's it's one of those funny things but um a random guy emailed me on facebook and i was like this is weird and i was like i had a look at it and i, was, I did a little bit of research and it was from this rally team in china and he was just like the translator and they were looking, trying to get a driver. Um, and I was like, oh, this seems a bit weird. And I did some research. I ended up getting a four-year career racing in China for them driving a world rally car. You know, it's just like <laughs> some of the best times ever. And like Pro Drive became involved and we had a world rally car and we're traveling all over China, racing a world rally car, having an absolute blast. So it's, um, yeah, all from a, a thing you could have just pressed the lead on. So it's funny how things happen. If this episode teaches us anything, it's that if you receive a random message on Facebook, they want you to race rally cars in China. Where was the first drive in a WRC car? What was that WRC car, given that you've talked about some discussions with M Sport and I'm assuming Malcolm Wilson and and, and those guys, and how how did you find it? Was it mind-blowing? What did you think? Yes, so it was, funnily enough, on snow in... in, um I guess we were in Sweden testing. Um, so that so I'd never driven on snow, never driven a world rally car, and <laughs> that was basically straight straight into it. Um, I would have shaken it down, but never driven like on a stage in one. And I went to see Tommy Mackinnon and Passy Hagstrom. They were doing a ice driving school in Finland. So I, I'd never because I had never driven it, so I had no idea. Um, and I went up and did a couple of days ice driving with them just to, to get my head around that. But that was just in a group N car. And obviously, great. Like, imagine we were, what, 24 and you got Tommy Mackin in there and he was sort of showing me how to drive on ice. So, yeah, very, very cool experience. Um, and then we went, must have gone straight across to Sweden to test the World Rally car and Peter was testing and I hopped in the car and went for a ride with Petter first. And I still remember the road. The road is amazing. We've used it as a test road before. Like it's, there's six gear airborne sideways where you got both ends of the car touching the snowbanks. Wow. Insanely fast and just fun. Cause that's, that's basically the fastest rally of the year. The, the Swedish rally average speed wise. Um, then the next day it was my go and I just went for it. You know, I just didn't, didn't care. And basically on my third run, I was pretty much matching Petter. So the the engineers were pretty impressed and pretty happy. And yeah, like that, like they're so cool world rally cars. Like people have no idea. Um, they are ridiculously quick on a, on a stage, like on a rally road, like the speeds you can carry and the things you can do is unbelievable. Like that, I, I know... Peter had taken Michael Schumacher in the car up there. It might have been that test. And he basically said it was like the, one of the greatest experiences in a car in his life. That's like going for a ride in a rally car. Um, and you've done it, I'm sure. But it, it's very dependent on the road. You've got, for me, you've got to, if you're on a road in Finland or Sweden or something like that, or even New Zealand, a proper road in a world rally car, I don't think there is almost an experience in a car in the world that would match it. It's an interesting thing for me because you talked about how how young you were and, and you know, that, that, that you were not afraid to throw caution to the wind at, at, at that stage and so on. But but rally drivers compared to, say, Formula One drivers and, and others over the years have typically bloomed later, haven't they? It, it, it takes time, mate, doesn't it, to, to have that... Um, fearless approach that you that you clearly need but but to be able to dance it right on the very edge 
safely. That's not an easy thing, I would imagine. No, it's... Um, you look at Formula One these days, like they're 20, 21 years old and they're competitive. So it it's not that... Um, and even in rally, it starts to be that way, but you've got to start so young to build up that experience. Um, it, I look at it more like, hey, I was 24, which isn't super young, but I'd only been rallying for four years. So my experience level was was still quite low and it's just managing the risk but you've got to be you're not going to be competitive unless you're right on the edge in every corner and you're still trying to manage the risk so it's 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 such such a challenge and the consequences are so instantaneous like it's done it's just like bang one small mistake one thing offline one wrong pace note done um out of a three-day race i think like in come 07 08 when i we'd come to grips that maybe we weren't going to be able to win in the car we had then and I, my experience was quite high at that stage you'd say I knew the rallies I knew the roads I knew where to push where not push then you manage the game a lot better and you could sort of go okay I'm aiming for third and you could pretty much you know run third or fourth pretty consistently and know the risk level to take but you know if you follow uh, you follow these guys through the stages like you follow Loeb and Gronholm at the time and they are putting the wheels in the ditches on every freaking corner you know they are when they are going they are not not taking risks they are absolutely on it I remember I was pretty safe in third one year in um, Finland so I was sort of just conserving my spot so I was third on the road behind Sebastian and Marcus. And I'm watching the lines and it was ridiculous. Like every stage, they are just in ditches, bouncing off bushes and banks and just absolutely on the limit and like battling each other for the win. Like it and getting away with it. Like that's how how good these guys were. They were they were able to do that and not make a mistake, you know. Um, but I think in a rally car you really have to back yourself. You know, you have to have utter belief because you can't go that fast without taking massive risks and then you have to rely on your underlying skill to get away with it. So I'd always take an approach early on in the rally. If I hadn't have a, a moment like in the first kilometre, I wasn't going fast enough, basically. And you knew that. If you had if you hadn't had a moment in the first kilometre, you were you were off the pace and you knew it. So that was always sort of a bit of a benchmark to know if you were going well straight away. Terrific names that you've rattled off uh, along the way here from, you know, hanging out with the goat in Sebastian Loeb, having a teammate like like Peter Solberg, getting some advice from a legend in in Tommy Mackinnon. I mean, great period, Chris, to be around. It must have been a little bit surreal in that sense. I know you're an athlete and you're chasing it, but to be in that space with these people, very, very special. They're absolute legends, all those guys, and um, to be sort of mates with them, was very cool and they're all just good guys like um like just awesome awesome dudes so and rallies like that you know everyone pretty much everyone gets along there's the odd one that uh is a bit of hard work but then the majority of them are are great guys because you're not pushing each other off the track you're just battling each other one one stage at a time and there's no hard feelings if you get beaten you get beaten it wasn't anyone else's fault but your own so i think that's why everyone can get along so well and um they were all fairly open to, like, they were all supportive as well at the same time. Like, Marcus would come up and say things like, uh, like when I do a good time and things like that. So even though they were in different teams, they were were quite supportive. And you see that, like, see Lewis Hamilton at the moment starting to make comments to, to other drivers and things like that. He's sort of so comfortable in him, where he's at himself that he's happy to give compliments. And Rowling's always had that, you know, um, it, it, that's how how we are. You know, you're supportive as much as you are competitive against each other. So, you know, the learning curves at, at this stage. I mean, you've talked about how how committed you need to be and and so on. Were there lows for you here, Chris? Whether it be be crashes or uncompetitive moments, and and how certain was it all when you first ventured into the WRC? I I think. Um, when I left Mexico in 05, I remember sitting on a plane flying back to, I think I was flying to Australia. I felt like I'd done some stage times that was super competitive um, and I felt like finally I was meant to be there. You know, I I, I deserved to be there on on pure merit. Um, so that that was um, was a nice feeling. Um, I said in a debrief 
it must have been after that Sweden test because we were still in the 04 car and I hadn't driven the 05 car. And Petter said, unless we change something, we're not going to win another rally this year. And and I, I had no idea at the time. And, and I remember that so clearly. Like he was so adamant um, that the new car was not not going to work and that he didn't want to go out of the 04 car. And unfortunately, he was right. Um, <laughs> didn't win for a, for a long time after that. Um, so um, it was definitely a challenging time. Like I was so new in 05 that it didn't matter. Um, and I guess getting a podium in a world championship like at, in Japan, so that sort of secured my place in the team and I had some good results and not too many mistakes. But then when I started to push a bit further and um, say 06 and the car definitely wasn't quite what it needed to be, that's where probably more mistakes crept in than than should have been because I was just, I didn't accept that that was the case, you know, um, and I was trying to learn and push, but the car probably wasn't capable of it, which Petter was showing as well. So that was a, definitely a challenge because, it was sort of when I should have been really starting to ramp things up and they weren't going the right way. So, yeah, there was some tough times there, um, which you find hard to see yourself getting that down when you're in a world championship team and like you're that age and everything's looking great, but it, you want to you want to keep moving forward. You don't want to be moving backwards. So that was that was definitely challenging. And I think when we, we started to realize the limitations so there was definitely different engineering groups at pro drive that you've got we had fx as petter's car engineer yet he couldn't say really what he wanted to say to the design engineers and then fx goes and designs the volkswagen and goes and wins multiple world championships you know so they they had people there that had the skills and it just became um like i still got friends at pro drive and stuff like that and i'm i just say so i don't want to be too disrespectful but it just the the culture maybe wasn't um right for getting the most out of the the vehicle um you had the guys there that could do it 100 percent, but there was there was just blockages in the system that didn't really um allow the car to be all it could be and there were some design philosophies which were outdated, to be honest. Then once I drove some other world rally cars, you sort of realised that the, the the damper travel um, compared to the other cars was like we we group N cars nearly with as much much travel. And then I remember we were uh, Mads Osberg was in a customer car with Riger dampers, and we had our car um, in Sweden. Um, I'm going to say early '07 and we were going on about travel and droop and everything like this. Like we, we needed the inside wheel to come out more things. And we had this problem with the car just turning into an absolute bucket um, and just becoming basically impossible to handle and just throwing you off the road. And you just, I, I'm sure there's videos out there of Petter almost snaking down the road in Finland at like 80K an hour, like barely trying to keep the car on the road, like things like that. It was just some things were fundamentally wrong. Um, and they'd say, oh, no, you can't have more travel. We can't design that. And then you look across at the customer um, car of Mads Osberg, had it. Like, it was there in front of you. You can, And I'd be like with DR going, look, why has he got it? And he's a customer and we don't. And you'd overlay their data and they'd have so much more lateral grip on the data, like ridiculous, and we'd do the same time. And it's like, well, if we had his grip, we'd be like, you'd be up with the front runners. Um, and they designed things like there was a... There were there were people trying to understand it. You know why didn't we have the grip? Why didn't why wasn't it working? And there was this um, design guru at the back, like just a um, almost a crazy mad scientist, and he made this huge wheel. So there was guys like you really working hard to try and solve it, but it, there were just some underlying issues, and they did get to the bottom of it in the end. But um, he had this wheel, and it had like a huge metal drum in the in this two story building, and it had bumps on it like metal bumps to try and replicate rocks and he was running um different damper like corners over like have a group n um set up and then a world rally car set up and try and understand it and the group n car he could calculate more grip than our world rally car so no way uh, yeah (laughs) so we were 
it was especially apparent when the grip changes. So you could get it dialed in on one grip surface, but then the grip would change and then you just disappear. Like the pace would just go. And we tried. I did, I tested for ten days in a row in Sardinia, and we'd lock like physically have three lock diffs so the car should not basically turn and I could go and flick it down the road and it would spin like 360 down the road. It was just ridiculous. So um, there was a lot of effort going to try and make it work but um, incredibly frustrating times Um, and maybe what led to the the demise of the, the relationship with Subaru in the end as much as the GFC did as well. That's the end of part one of my podcast with Aussie rally driver Chris Atkinson. A quick thanks to all of you who listen and have liked, subscribed or left a review. We really appreciate it. Hopefully friends and family are enjoying Rusty's Garage too. Now, the second part of my chat with Chris is in the library and ready for a stage start right now. We talk about his fave WRC car, why it wasn't just the GFC that hurt the competitiveness of one car he had high hopes for. A fun, wrecky car yarn. Man, they get a punishment, those things. And an insight into rallycross and hanging out with Hoonigan Ken Block. Listener.